Hello everyone, welcome to the Tekken Auto Show. I'm your host Manav Sinha and it is so good to see all of you lovely people once again. This is that one show which will satisfy your hunger for port technology as well as automobiles at one place. Now, we have a lot of action to cover in this episode. Like really, take a look at what's coming your way in the next half an hour. This week, we will be getting our hands on the Apple iPhone 12. We also go for a ride on the Royal Enfield Meteor 350. Get up and close with the new Hyundai i20 and take a closer look at the Samsung Galaxy S20 FE. So as you saw, a lot of action coming your way, but of course we're going to start off with the Apple iPhone 12. Now that phone doesn't really need an introduction because we all know what it is. It is an iPhone. So how is the latest iPhone out there right now? Well, Vishal has spent some time with it and here's what he has to say about it. It is that time of the year again when Apple makes a pretty enticing pitch for you to upgrade to the next lineup of iPhones. This year, it's even more interesting. The iPhone 12 lineup for 2020 is actually four devices big. You have the iPhone 12 mini, which is the smallest of them all. You have the iPhone 12, which succeeds the iPhone 11. You have the iPhone 12 Pro, which succeeds the iPhone 11 Pro. And you have the biggest iPhone 12 Pro Max, which succeeds the iPhone 11 Pro Max from last year. What we are going to have is the iPhone 12 mini and the iPhone 12 Pro Max coming in a bit later. At this time, what you can buy are the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 12 Pro. Gorgeous looking things, aren't they? It's a pretty interesting pitch in the sense that Apple has really gone the whole hog this year. A completely new design language, even better displays, more powerful performance, improved cameras, both on the hardware and the software side, as well as the new MagSafe chargers. And there's 5G. There's 5G in a lot of countries where it's going to matter to you. It doesn't really matter to us right now because there are no 5G networks. But if you're in a country with 5G at this moment, these iPhones make a pretty serious pitch to you. In terms of the design, Apple have kind of gone a bit into the past with a more modern mix. This is the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 12 Pro design, which is now with flat sides. If you remember, the iPhone 5 and the iPhone 5S were the last phones to have this sort of a flat side design. Right now, it's the iPad Pro and the iPad Air devices which have something similar. A lot of people had often asked Apple to really refresh the design language with the next line of iPhones. That is what Apple has done. Now, a lot of people are cribbing saying, oh, Apple has gone into the past and can't really innovate. Come on, give the guys a break. This is a great design. It's finally one of those iPhones which you can actually stand. You can keep those standing up on the table. It's, it's just, I mean, everything just feels better. What has also happened is, compared to last year's phones, let's say, let's pick up the 6.1 inch uh, screen sizes from last year, these phones feel a lot more compact. That is because the bezels around the screen and the curves on the sides have been eliminated, which means they have a slightly more compact footprint as you hold them. All those millimeters that Apple has managed to shave off will matter a lot when you're trying to pocket the phone or do single hand operations or even use them largely in a slightly complicated environment that little shaving of millimeters really is going to make a difference. In terms of the display, what you now have are even higher resolution screens. It all really works out very, very well. These are slick, these are brilliant to see even in bright sunlight. And well, they, even though they are reflective, they're quite bright. So it's not really going to matter to you even when you're outside in the bright sunlight. What are the other big updates? The new A14 Bionic processor is taking over from last year's chip, which itself was the fastest in the smartphone ecosystem. We really have gone beyond the processor capabilities as a criteria when you're buying a new phone, particularly the iPhones. The A14 Bionic is going to pretty much blow everything else out of the water which is available, particularly in the Android ecosystem right now. Cameras have also been given an upgrade, not in terms of megapixels, it's still the same megapixel count as before, but there's, there's new hardware which is running in the camera modules, and there's even better software which is processing the images when you're actually using them. Both these phones get video recording capabilities with Dolby Vision HDR. That makes it the first for smartphones to do that. You can also edit those Dolby Vision videos on the device itself. It's very, very quick. It really doesn't make sense for me to show you a Dolby Vision uh, uh, video on a standard uh, resolution uh, display, but what you can get 
on the iPhone 12 is Dolby Vision video recording up to 30 frames per second and say up to 60 frames per second on the iPhone 12 Pro. And then I would now like to show you something very interesting, the MagSafe charger. Quite neat. This is the MagSafe charger, a wireless charger for the iPhone. There you go. That's it. Now what this basically, and it's pretty solid by the way, it's not going anywhere. There you go. What this basically opens up is a whole variety of possibilities for the iPhone. You can get some really cool test mounts, you can get some really cool mounts for the in-car system. This MagSafe will work with a case as well and you just need the case to actually be compatible with MagSafe which most iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 Pro cases will anyways be. One thing that I did notice though was these slight rings that show up after you've used the MagSafe charger. So you will have to just wipe these once and there you go. All in all, it's really a pretty simple upgrade. You get more power, you get a better display, you get slightly better battery life, you get iOS 14 that you've already seen in the existing devices but everything just feels better, everything feels faster and it's great to hold. So the new iPhone lineup has already started coming to India with the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 12 Pro. Great devices, you can buy the iPhone 12 in multiple colors, what I've just showed you is the product red, you can get this in a new green color as well. The iPhone 12 Pro here is the blue variant, the Pacific blue, it's just gorgeous and you have your graphite, silver uh, and gold color options available as well. 2020 lineup of the Apple iPhones, the Apple iPhone 12 and the Apple iPhone 12 Pro really make for serious upgrades even if you use last year's phones. That is a pretty big improvement in itself, that's a pretty serious upgrade in itself and that just tells us that this year's phones are not those incremental updates that we see from a lot of other phone makers and we've seen through the years. All in all, if you're looking to spend a lot of money on a new iPhone, well, it'll be worth it. Now let's move on to the world of automobiles where the Royal Enfield Meteor has been taking up a lot of spotlight because well, it's the latest Royal Enfield in town. Now before it got launched, I got to spend five days with the motorcycle riding it both on the highway and the city and here's how it went. The Royal Enfield pretty much showed the world that they can make motorcycles that everyone has to stand up and take notice of. The motorcycles that gave them this reputation is the Interceptor 650 and the Continental GT 650. Now, both of these motorcycles were leaps and bounds ahead of any other motorcycle that Royal Enfield has ever made. Now, however, they have taken all of those learnings, that approach, and brought it down to the 350cc segment. Interestingly though, it's not the classic 350 that debuts that approach, but it's a motorcycle that replaces the Thunderbird series of offerings from Royal Enfield. That motorcycle is this. It's called the Meteor 350 and at this point, I've spent about five days riding this motorcycle through city, through highway, and here's what I have to say about it. Now let's begin our understanding of the motorcycle by first talking about the design. Now, at first glance, the Meteor 350 might look a little bit similar to the Thunderbird X series of motorcycles that Royal Enfield came out with, but once you see it in flesh, you realize that's really not the case. That's because Royal Enfield says that they have not carried over any part from the Thunderbird motorcycle to the Meteor 350. Everything that you see here is brand spanking new. Now, the thing to note is there are three variants on offer. The entry-level variant is called Fireball, the one that sits on top of it is called Stellar, and the topmost variant is called Supernova. That variant is the one that you see right here. It gets these extra chrome bits, the backrest, the fancy wind deflector. You get the idea. This is supposed to give you that big cruiser feel. Now looks are a subjective matter, so I'll let you decide how you find this motorcycle, but there are some key design elements that I want to bring to your notice. First and foremost, I have to mention that Royal Enfield has upped the standards of the build quality and the quality of materials used. The paint finish is great and it makes the bike feel premium, as in, you see where your money has gone. Royal Enfield has taken some interesting design choices too. Like, the fuel tank cap has no visible hinge or a key slot when the lid is closed and that looks really nice. You also get these really old school toggle switches for ignition and the headlamp controls, which take some time getting used to but retain their novelty factor. 
You also get a USB port under the left switch cluster, which sounds nice, but is actually an ergonomic nightmare as getting the wire to plug in takes a lot of effort due to lack of space and only works when the engine is turned on. I would have much rather had an underseat USB port. Coming to the instrument cluster, the one on the left is a semi-digital unit that shows pretty basic information like your autometer, two trip meters, a clock and the gear position indicator. I did miss having a range indicator because well, the meteor is built for long distance riding and for that, knowing your range is really important. This brings us to the second smaller dial on the right which is a digital display that Royal Enfield calls a stripper navigation. It is basically a clock unless you pair this to Royal Enfield's smartphone app via Bluetooth, through which it will show turn-by-turn -turn navigation and this is immensely helpful. However, it does not show things like messages, music or call notification and that's a bit of a bummer. Lastly, the headlamps are halogens and not LEDs, but they have really good throw and offer good visibility at night and I'd much rather have these than a fancier looking but less effective LED cluster. Now that we have taken a closer look at the motorcycle, the next thing to do is, well, sit on it. And the first thing that you will notice the moment you sit on the Meteor 350 is just how comfortable this motorcycle is. It's a relaxed riding position. It's similar to what you would expect out from a cruiser, but there's nothing extreme about it. Like, you've got forward set foot pegs, but it's not extreme. You're not sitting with your legs stretched out. The handlebar is high up, you just do the rider, but then again, nothing extreme. And for reference, I am 5 foot 10 and you can see how everything just falls naturally to my height. Uh, the next thing to note is the seat height. It's really low and it lets you plant both of your feet firmly onto the ground. So even shorter riders will not have any problem whatsoever. With that done, let's talk about the riding experience. Like I said, everything that you see on the Meteor is brand new and that includes a brand new engine and a brand new chassis as well. The engine is a 349cc single cylinder air cooled unit that makes 20.2 bhp of power and 27 newton meters of torque. It comes with fuel injection and it also gets a primary balancer shaft which has helped the engine have far lesser vibrations than the older 350 engine. There are still some vibrations that can be felt on the foot pegs when you lug the engine, but other than that, there's nothing to complain about. More importantly, the thump of the Thunderbird is still there, and that is something Royal Enfield purists will appreciate. As for the performance, the engine now has 1000 RPM more than before, thanks to a bigger bore and a shorter stroke, and it now has a much larger spread of power across the RPM band. So much so that you wouldn't really mind and would be instead tempted to actually push the engine to the red line and even then there are minimal vibrations. The gearbox is still a 5 speed unit but it feels more than enough when you are doing highway speeds. And those speeds can be done by the Meteor all day long as it feels comfortable going over 100 km an hour. Handling has improved too thanks to the specifically built tires which are wider than before, both front and back, and the new stiff chassis which has aided handling to a great extent. The suspension setup is bang on as well and the bike holds its line a lot more confidently despite having a longer wheelbase. And yes, both tires are tubeless. The ground clearance has increased too as compared to the Thunderbird 350. Only thing that I would change though is the seat as that's a bit too soft and not really meant for long rides. In the city, during daily commutes though, this will do just fine. So to sum up the Meteor 350, well, there are two things that I want to talk about. First is the motorcycle itself and second is the repercussions of having this as an option in your options of Royal Enfields. Let's start with the bike pick first. You see, this is by itself a really good motorcycle. It is a step up as compared to the older Thunderbird 350 in every single way and in some respects it has better highway capabilities than even the Interceptor 650 thanks to its riding position. It's pretty much all the bike that you need, it is now refined, well built and is a proper motorcycle that we can recommend blindly. Now let's come to the repercussions part. You see the Meteor 350 is the new platform that will underpin the new 350s later on and this motorcycle basically makes all other 350s feel really old and 
not in a very good way because this is so far ahead once again. So if you're looking to get your hands on a new Royal Enfield, make sure that it is the Meteor 350. Now remember how I said the Royal Enfield Meteor 350 is taking up all the spotlight in the industry? Well, the other thing that's taking up all the rest of the spotlight is the new Hyundai i20. It has finally been launched in India. It is the new latest flagship hatchback offering from the house of Hyundai. And here's everything you need to know about the Hyundai i20. This is the new Hyundai i20 and it is going to be Hyundai's flagship hatchback offering in India. Let's take a closer look at what it has to offer. First and foremost, it will no longer have the Elite in its name and instead will simply be called as the i20. As you can see, it gets itself a brand new design both inside and out, meant to give it a sportier look. The new i20 looks a lot sharper and hunkered down as compared to the outgoing model and gets modern design elements that make it stand out. The same goes for the inside too as it gets a new dash design which includes two massive all digital displays in the form of this new touchscreen infotainment system and the all digital instrument cluster. As for the design, the AC vent lines run through the width of the dash and the car gets the latest generation steering from Hyundai as well. It will come with Hyundai's Blue Link connectivity system and will have features like cruise control and a wireless charging pad as well. It is also expected to be a lot more spacious than the outgoing model and yes, it will offer the choice of a sunroof as well. Now, let's talk about the variants. Majorly, there are four trims that you can choose from. Magna, Sports, Asta and the top spec Asta O. But thanks to the large number of engine and gearbox options, the number of actual variants on offer go all the way up to 24. But in order to make it simple, let's talk about the drivetrain options itself. First, there is a 1.2 litre naturally aspirated petrol engine that can be had with either a manual gearbox or a CVT automatic transmission. Then there is the choice of a 1.5 litre diesel engine that is only available with a manual gearbox and no automatic gearbox option at least as of now. And finally, there is the second choice of a petrol engine which is the one that you see here. The 1 litre turbocharged petrol unit that can be had with either a sporty DCT gearbox or the new IMT transmission which recently made its debut on the Hyundai venue. All in all, there's a lot of new things that are on offer with the new i20 including an all new design, a modern and up to date feature list and it is going to give buyers a lot of drivetrain options to choose from as well. What remains to be seen is how the car is to drive. We will soon be getting our hands on it, so make sure you stay tuned for the full review of the new Hyundai i20. And with that, it is time for a small break on the Tekken Auto Show. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching the Tekken Auto Show and I'm your host, Manav Sinha. Now, before going for the short commercial break in the first half of the show, we had promised to bring you the review of the Samsung Galaxy S20 FE. Well, let's not wait any further. Let's get to it right away. It really is no surprise when tech companies say they, they listen to a lot of consumer feedback and try to implement them in the next line of products. But what Samsung have done here is something that is rather interesting. They've launched a completely new phone based on consumer feedback. And as you would probably expect, that is pretty well reflected in the name of the product as well. It's called the Samsung Galaxy S20 Fan Edition or the Samsung Galaxy S20 FE. What happens here is that Samsung, with the S20 lineup being in the market for a while now, has listened to consumer feedback, what they wanted in the new phone, and basically brought out a phone which now becomes the new entry point into the Samsung Galaxy S20 smartphone lineup. 
So now what you have is the Samsung Galaxy S20 FE, which is the entry point, then the Samsung Galaxy S20, the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus, and at the top of the line sits the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. What the Samsung Galaxy S20 FE then brings to the table is, well, it's not compromising in terms of the experience. What you have is a pretty good build quality. From the front, it looks pretty much like a Samsung phone. Here you have it. This looks pretty much like a Samsung phone from the front, complete with the One UI at the top. Turn it around though and this is where things really change. While the Samsung Galaxy S20 series in general has been all about glass and metal, this one is a little different. This is a glass stick finish. So basically it's plastic but with a very nice finish to it. You can't really call it glass to be honest but well this really feels very nice. It's got a matte finish to it, light reflects off it very nicely. In certain times this looks a little tinge of blue, at other times it's actually what it is, cloud mint. It doesn't also catch fingerprints, so that really helps me in that regard. What has also changed is the camera setup at the back. Instead of the higher resolution, the higher megapixel cameras that the S20 phones have, this instead has two 12 megapixel cameras and an 8 megapixel camera. Don't be worried about the lack of the megapixel count though, because the photos that this pulls out across lighting conditions is absolutely fantastic. This camera also has the 30x zoom feature. Well, 30x is a little bit of a stretch to get really good photos out of but at 10x zoom and even at 20x zoom you get fairly good details. I mean those are very usable photos. In terms of the overall performance this runs the same Exynos processor as the other Samsung Galaxy S20 series phone so this is pretty much flagship level in terms of performance. This has got 6GB of RAM which again should be enough though 8GB or 12GB might have been a little more prudent in this time. It's got a lot of storage as well. It's got a 6.5 inch display which pretty well ticks off everything that you would want in a smartphone including the 120Hz resolution. So all in all, well, there's that familiarity aspect to a Samsung Galaxy S20 FE phone that you would perhaps find in other Samsung Galaxy phones as well. The One UI for instance just pretty much looks very similar. I perhaps would have wanted a little more in terms of that special feeling for the S20 FE phones just to add that little bit of excitement to a phone which is primarily meant more for the youth uh, I, I would rather believe. But nevertheless this works exactly as how you would expect it to. It's got great performance as far as I mean most applications and gaming is concerned it's got a great camera setup at the back which really pulls out great photographs it's got good battery life and well it's got a flagship level processor the price of this phone is 49,990 you can get this for even lesser if you play your credit cards right this becomes a new entry point in the S20 lineup and by far well it's a lot more inexpensive compared to the Samsung Galaxy S20 which till now is selling for around the 70,000 price point. So at about 20,000 rupees lesser, you now get similar level of performance and a very similar sort of experience. Well, I really hope Samsung listens to fans a lot more and we see more of the FE edition phones in the coming years. And with that, we've come to the end of this edition of the Tech & Auto Show. Make sure you let us know how you found the show by reaching out to us on Twitter. If it's about technology, reach out to us at News18 Tech. If it's about automobiles, your destination is News18 Auto. Well, that's about all for today. I'll catch you same time next week, only on CNN News18.